and of course we bear the image and we're sinful today. Here's just some options. A punctiliar event. Could it be evolutionary monogenism where an Adam and Eve are pulled off the evolutionary herd and that's where we go? Possibility number one. How about punctiliar at a point, polygenism, poly, many, in which you have many Adams and Eves, or the way I go is using my metaphor from an analogy from the womb. Could it be a gradual polygenistic approach where over many generations uh, the mysterious and manifest, uh, gradual manifestation of sin and the image of God emerge and there are no real Adams and Eves along the way. And by the way, I just got thrown just the way. This is Lucy's job there. I, I practiced dentistry for over 25 years. And, you know, when you're peering in these dentitions day in and day out, and the first time I saw Lucy, it hit me like a ton of bricks. If I would take that jaw, cover it over with a rubber dam, you know the rubber masks dentists put over your teeth, and show it to my, your, my colleagues, they would all say the first thing that's pretty dark, this kid must have been out of, born in the 60s, which there's a tetracycline stain. Well, that's the fossilization thing. Um, that dentition and those cusps and those bumps and grooves are effectively identical to us. But the one thing we know about this dentition that Lucy has, uh, and 35 million years ago, um, we know this, this is, it has a, a CC capacity just a little larger than chimpanzee. All right, human origins. Last common ancestor. Here's a way of looking at it, comparing it to chimpanzees who are closest evolutionary relatives, in which chimpanzees do not bear the image, chimpanzees are not sinful, and we who have the image. What are some possibilities? Leave these as possible, are you like Billy Graham, as a possibility if you went to the evolutionary route, evolutionary monogenism, and wherever these, you know, these show up on the, are, are purely arbitrary, or possibility of punctiliar polygenism or the position I sort of hold a gradual polygenistic approach to things in which these things are manifested but I can't really find a point on that because I can't see the same sort of point going on in the womb. Thing to note, some people are really threatened that we're only 1% difference between chimpanzees and us. You know, effectively we're identical in, in the flesh. But you know, stop and think. The Lord has put on this planet a critter that's almost the same in us in the flesh. But, but can't you see that they're so much different than us and we're so much different from them? When is the last time you've read chimp poetry? When, when, when is the last time you've, you've sang chimp and worship uh, music? When's the last time chimps have put a rover on Mars? When's the last time you've had a lecture from a chimp university professor? Don't answer that question. <laughs> We're so much more than flesh. I mean, I think this is fabulous. And we have a reason to believe why. And you heard the references to co-creators. I think the greatest thing that the Lord has given us is this creative impulse. And just think about all the guys who are scientists that do the science stuff and the academic. It's, the Lord's delighting in this stuff we do because that's an element that we, we have, by God's grace, been given. Okay, final reflections. Uh, define the terms, especially this word evolution. You have to put the brakes on people. Say, are you a disteleological evolution? What sort of evolutionist are you? And by the way, on the back of the handout, you'll notice I've got a series of categories. And on my website, I, un I go there a little more and I compare and contrast the different positions. And the other thing I forgot to mention is, uh, thanks to ASA, I published a paper on the three-tier universe in March. So if you want to see uh, that in a lot more detail, you're more than welcome to go there. Okay. Question, are evangelicals coming to terms with evolution? Let me tell you, I find this a really interesting coincidence. I'm just about to jump, you know, about to jump on a plane, and then I get the Bruce Waltke quote, and I'm, my head is still spinning on that. Uh, the one thing I will say that when I became an evolutionist, uh, my love for the Lord Jesus didn't change one iota compared to when I was a young earth creationist. My hermeneutics are different. My science is different. Fair enough. Question, is Genesis 1 to 3, can we use this as a precedent? What do I mean by that? If we look at Genesis 3 and we see this 1 to 3, this ancient science, that the Holy Spirit's going down and using, using this ancient stuff as a vessel to give us the living waters, using John 4 as the metaphor, could it be that we can, we can do the very same thing where we take out the living waters and then put it within an evolutionary context? And at the same time, though I'm an evolutionary biologist, I understand science, maybe evolution's all going to crash and burn. We're going to be able to take the living waters out and put it on whatever scientific theory we come up as being the best scientific theory. And finally, and here's my last point, and really it's the only reason. Do I argue my case? Sure. Do I force it? Absolutely not. I have one really, I mean, it, it shakes me every time. I teach in a secular university. And my heart goes out to the pre matters because they're seeing all the evolutionary evidence, especially the molecular stuff today, the evo devo and evolutionary genetic stuff. And uh, I have kids that come into my class, 
And the only way they can survive down there is do the compartmentalizing thing. And they know this ain't the right way to do it. And some of them have lost their faith. I've chatted with kids like that. And it breaks my heart simply because of bad category set. My only suggestion is give them an option. Their faith can be remain intact. And uh, it's just a, a delight to be working in that sort of area. Okay, started with cartoon. Here's my final cartoon. God throws the creationists a curve. But that doesn't make any sense. Maybe it does make sense. Thanks a lot. George Murphy. Do you know something? I don't, but maybe you can say there are. I mean, I'm, I'm, it, it's an area where I really haven't gone. That's a great question, George. I, I don't know. Yes, sir. Oh. Yeah, it's a great question. And I don't want to sound like I'm self-righteous. This little book here, when I look at some theological colleagues that sort of started out basically the same route, keep the book closed. You watch what happens to the theology. Open the book. And again, I'm not saying this self-righteously. And you don't need any hermeneutical skill set to encounter Jesus in the text. Um, as this is going on, and believe me, there were moments where I was spinning pretty hard. There was always a sense of the Lord is there because I, I'm talking to the Lord every day in, in the Word of God. And, of course, the community of faith. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay watch this. <laughs> There's my book. Sorry for the shameful... So I, I, I better be an I better be an evolutionary creationist. My question is, you know, I mean, obviously that comes with a lot of with any terms. Just having the word creationist in it. Is there a way you think in terms of is your idea of trying to sort of redeem this term, or to say, you know what, I'm going to throw it out there, and even if I'm going to get confused at times, this is where I am. You know, so that's an interest. Is there a, look, at, there's a whole lot of polemic going on in that term. It's sort of putting ba people back on their heels. Again, I didn't coin it. It comes out of reform circles, and I wish I could find out who it was. But the whole point of, of putting that, if you wish, conundrum to the culture is to have them step back and say, what does evolution mean? What does creation mean? And you'll notice I got the word in the substantive. Now, another thing with regards to the, the cover, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a wonderful, I won't mention her name here, but it's a wonderful uh, a colleague. She said to me, you know, you're really irritating but lovable. Here's me being irritating. This is Ernst Haeckel's evolutionary tree. And, and uh, there was a presentation here just a couple before. Ernst Haeckel hated Christians with a supernatural hatred. Uh, and if you go to his 1874 book, read the foreword. It's amazing what he says. I mean, he is the Dick Dawkins of the 18th century. So what have I done here being the irritating little man I am? I've... <laughs> I've taken his evolutionary tree, and of course, I've brought in that big Sistine Chapel hand. And so am I creating a little bit of tension, a little PR stuff, as you say? I confess. You're right. Margaret. Well, that's a great question. You know, so, you know, so I never get that question in my class because I'm building the case as I go there. And I don't, you know, they'll say, what about Adam and Eve? I say, nope, week 12 of a 13-week course. So, you know something? I'll have to think about that, Margaret, because, uh, but, I, but, but you see what, I'll tell you what I do in my science religion class. Though it's called science and religion, it's really a hermeneutics class from, day one and it's going kaboom 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 
And uh, I, will, I will say one thing with, with regards to the evangelicals, and I can always remember this absolutely delightful young woman named Crystal. She exploded in class, it just, just snapped. She goes, I am so mad at my parents. They sent me to this evangelical school and paid all these dollars. I'm so mad at my pastor. And, and I said to her, I go, I get it. But you know something? If you want to do this, come to my office. You can even use bad words. <laughs> but when you go back to the church, we've got to rethink this. And we've got to be gentle because it takes a while to get there. What I've done here today, I wouldn't do in a church I got, a, I, got a, I got a select crew here, right? So uh, preaching to the choir. I'm preaching to the choir effectively. Uh, Mark, I'm going to think about that. It's a great question. I've never had it asked to me. Okay, well, let's.